we are going to talk about one of my favorite things about organic gardening and that is getting to sprinkle beneficial flowers around the garden. So we talked a little bit about this and the companion planting. There are reasons that flowers can help either invite pollinators into the garden or also deter you know, bugs from finding your plants, just masking the overall scent, but also it is just going to help beautify your whole garden. Like asking and inviting all these flowers to kind of sprinkle around in the greenery is just going to take the level of gorgeousness of your garden up by a considerable amount. So we'll talk about um, a variety. I've got a lot here that I'm going to dive into. Now there's a few reasons why I've chosen these specific ones to share with you. Um, some of them are really really fantastic for companion planting. Some of them are uh, medicinal flowers so there you can make them into teas or salves or all sorts of stuff so those are a big thing. Some of them are perennials and uh, and then I'll note some of the perennials to where I am zone three. Um, and so you're, if you're in anything less than that, you're fantastic. But perennial flowers is just great because it's less work for you. Um, so those are kind of the main reasons why I'm going to share this with you. This is not the most exhaustive list ever. Um, we could go on for days and days and talk about that. But from a ease of gardening and bringing in pollinators and companion planting. These are kind of like my favorite, my hit list here. Now, so some plants that require pollination, so we need the pollinators to come in. And the reason is these plants like cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, these guys are all in the same family. Um, the male flower and the female flower are on the plant, but they're two separate. They're not together. So we need one to get to the other, the male pollen to get into the female flower. So that female flower in turn is going to create fruit for you. So those plants, we really need to concentrate lots of flowers around so that we don't have to do manual pollination as much or maybe at all. Corn um, and fruit bushes and trees and stuff like that are other ones. Now, things that don't require pollination, but obviously are going to be helped out. So the pistil and the stamen, so the male and the female flower, are, are the male and the female part are in the same flower. So tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, legumes, you can't see underneath but this says peas. Um, these guys, all it takes is wind on the plant, moving the plant, and that's going to get the pollen from one part of the flower into the other part of the flower. So that's kind of nice that way. So just to give you some ideas, these guys are the ones that really, really need the extra help. Now, things that we would want to sort of note is bloom time of certain flowers. So some flowers will flower all season long, which is great. That's like your easiest ones to keep around. Some are early, some are really late, some are mid-season. And so the idea is that we plant a little bit of all the things so that we have continuous blooming so that there's not ever like a, a flower drought, if we will, so that the pollinators just stay in the garden all the time from early to late in the season. Also, are these zinnias not super gorgeous? <laughs> so variety of colors is also a really good thing to kind of note. Um, a couple things here, and this is not um, the only things they'll go for, but blues and purples are favorite favorites of bumblebees. They like all the things, but those guys are the top. White especially. And then yellows and oranges often are a little more for butterflies, but you will definitely see bees hitting up like the marigolds and calendula and sunflowers um, as well. So first one is borage. Now these are edible. These flowers are edible. They taste like cucumbers and they're, they flower prolifically, so one of these plants will produce a lot. It is a big plant. It will get to be about three feet tall um, and often requires something to hold it up because it'll kind of fall over in the garden and then, you know, regrow, but it, it can very easily smother or shade other things in your garden, so that's something you're just going to want to keep in mind. This thing also, when it seeds, it will drop seeds wherever it is planted and next year those seeds are going to come up like crazy. So it is a self-seeding plant. Um, 
It's not a perennial, but you can expect a lot of little baby borage plants wherever the original was next season. Some people don't like that, um, so I am always just want to make sure that you are aware of the ones that are the heavy self-seeders and that you'll end up with a lot of volunteers. If you want lots of volunteers, you know, you this is the plant for you. If you don't want to deal with that, this may not be the plant for you, or you're going to want to stick it somewhere where it's not going to end up you know, having to be maybe weeded out of your garden or thinned out a little bit. Uh, but the flavor of it is amazing and bumblebees go crazy for it, this particular plant. So it's one of my must plants in my garden. Alyssum is just the tiniest, most gorgeous little flower. It is an edible flower. Um, this is its most common color. Sometimes you can get it in like white. It is a pollinator favorite because of this. It's also a low growing, it's a good ground cover to kind of fill in in between plants just because it's not going to cause shading of things. It's very low, it fills in all the spaces, it brings in all the flowers. Um, something to note is the flea beetles do enjoy eating this particular plant. So you may need to either wait a while till the flea beetles are done at the earliest part of the season before you plant it or maybe keep some backup plants around or plant it with your um, underneath like your row cover fabric with the uh, like all your borage and not your borage your brassicas pardon me brains not working today if you don't want it to get devoured by the flea beetles so those are just a couple things to note um, but sometimes they only find it in one part of your garden and they don't find it in another so that's always nice now this guy is a perennial, which is fun, uh, butterfly, butterfly flower, and this one if you have like a perennial garden or you're considering, these guys you maybe not always want to stick in your vegetable garden, but close by if you have just like a section that you want to dedicate to those flowers that are always going to come back, this is a great one, very, very popular with the butterflies, hence its name. Chamomile, I absolutely love chamomile. Um, we know it as chamomile tea. Uh, you can make it into bath tea, you can make it into a salve because chamomile has a lot of really medicinal, like powerful medicinal oils in it. And it is a self seeding flower. So wherever you plant chamomile, it is going to come back. I have a couple years actually forgot to. Um, start chamomile and then it just volunteered in different places in my garden and I was like wonderful I don't have to do anything but again you need to know if you're not a big fan of volunteer plants ie things you may have to weed out you got to consider that uh, but it will flower almost all season from mid-season to late and those white flowers the bees just go wild for and medicinal always moves things higher on the priority list for myself calendula is another medicinal flower uh, the oils in this are known for being really, really great for your skin. And calendula is a big plant. It grows a couple feet tall. You may need to prop it up because it will potentially fall over on neighboring plants. But it flowers like crazy. The bees love it. And it is a self-seeder, definitely. I no longer start um, like any ahead of time because I know that I'm going to have lots of volunteers in my garden. Same thing with borage. It's already doing its thing. I just sort of dig up where I don't want them and I move them and I stick them somewhere else, which makes it fairly easy that way. And the flowers dry really easy and you will get a ton of them. So if you would like the idea of having, like making your own lotions or whatever it is and having that extra medicinal oil, you will get tons from this. So it's a good one to keep around. Uh, dandelions, we don't always love dandelions, but they are medicinal. You can make teas and tinctures and stuff like that with them. They're your early, early flowers, uh, which actually makes them massively beneficial because they tend to flower before a lot of other things and that makes them vital to the health of your pollinators coming into your yard and your garden. So if you want to have them around, you know, you can kind of balance it out with maybe before they go to seed, yank them after they flower. Totally up to you, but I always feel like it's an important one just to note because there's a lot of benefits to it. Lavender, who doesn't love lavender? Um, this guy is a perennial if you're in a like zone four or five, which is kind of exciting. I actually tend to dig up my lavender and I bring it into the house for the winter and then I stick it back outside um, as long as like bugs and things haven't already infested it to keep life easy. But 
you will be able to harvest flowers off of this for probably about midsummer all the way to late summer and you can make you know your tea bath tea whatever you want it's got like medicinal oils in it which is great the purpley flowers all the pollinators go crazy for it so that one is a must plant in my garden Marigolds we talked about a lot in um, the companion planting video. They just have one of those aromas that masks a lot of other plants and they are actually edible, which is kind of exciting. So you can plant lots of different kinds of these. I once upon a time bought a, um, I can't remember what the name of the variety is, but it grows like two feet tall. So <laughs> mindful of the variety that you buy, if you don't want it throwing shade on neighboring things in your garden, make sure it's just a short growing, not a super tall growing variety. But there's lots of different, like the shape of the blooms and stuff like that. There's little bitty guys, so you can definitely kind of find a good variety even within marigolds. And they're super easy to grow. They don't require much maintenance at all. Now nasturtium. I love nasturtium. You can eat the leaves and the flowers and they are spicy. So it just adds a really interesting to like wraps and salads and all sorts of different stuff. They are both bush varieties. They'll stay nice and tall, um, nice and small, or there is a climbing version, which will get probably about almost three feet. I've had it climb all the way up my trellises and it is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, the flea beetles do really like this particular plant and when the nasturtium is just a little baby plant at the beginning of the season flea beetles can potentially decimate the whole flower they might eat the whole thing on you so one way to get around this is either to cover it with row cover fabric early in the season or wait until the flea beetles are done flea beetles are usually like the cool beginning of the season and then eventually they kind of peter off and then you could stick these guys outside so there's a couple things to consider or you could just plant some backups. That's always something that I like to do. Uh, I usually plant enough nasturtium that they bounce back just fine. And if there's ever an issue, they don't usually get completely destroyed. Um, petunias, everybody loves petunias. They are, they're just a great one to have in the garden and they're a good ground cover. Um, you can get those like waterfall petunias, which we often see spilling out of pots. But if you kind of want to like fill in some, you know, across the ground, so you have less weeding and stuff like that, they're really great. As long as you keep deadheading and picking off the dead flowers, they're just going to keep producing like crazy for you. And I've, I've noted a couple, a couple companions here as well, just to help out we like them. They invite in the pollinators. Purple cone flower, or also known as echinacea. Um, we know echinacea. It's a common one for like immune system and colds and stuff like that. So a medicinal flower, always very exciting when it is a perennial to my growing zone here. It does take a while before it's actually going to flower for you. Um, but you can make it into like teas and salves and all sorts of stuff like that. And almost the entire plant is used if you really, really want to get into that. But besides that, they're just really tall and really beautiful. Um, this would be more for a like perennial flower garden type spot. You probably want, wouldn't want to stick them in your vegetable garden because they need to be left where they are to like really develop and produce flowers and stuff like that. But if you've got like a little perennial patch close to your garden, they are perfect. Uh, Liatris, this is another perennial to lovely my zone three. The flowers on them, I just can't get enough of. Um, butterflies really, really love them. And it's just easy. It's an easy flower. The, everything loves them. And it's kind of just a win-win to have around. You, you would want to obviously have the space to dedicate to this kind of perennial flower. It's not one you're going to want to stick smack in the middle of your vegetable garden, but again, close by. Bachelor buttons. These are also a great one to have kind of in your perennial garden somewhere around. They are not a perennial, but they self seed. They drop seeds and then they sprout again the next year, which I kind of put into the perennial category because that means I don't have to do more work. And they're just, they're one of those flowers that the bugs and the bees really love to hang out in. So I like to keep them around and they're just really kind of fun, pretty blues. Fasolia. I am a big fan of this guy. It is super easy to grow. It flowers crazy early. Like the plants could be this big and the little thing will be sprouting out flowers, which is pretty awesome, I think. So I like this guy for that reason. It's a super easy one to get the pollinators in the garden, like at the very, very beginning of the season. And it'll flower for almost the first half of the season. Um, so that's 
good one to keep around. Um, it's it's well known for being a good one for companion planting and vegetable gardening just because of that super early flower. There's not a lot of flowers that'll just go as wild as this right off the hop. Zinnias, I just love zinnias. They just come in way too many fun colors. Uh, they will flower all season for you. If you just keep deadheading them, they're going to keep flowering. So that's kind of exciting. You can get them in short little ones. You can get them in big tall ones. You can get all sorts of different sizes of flowers. So it's it's easy to kind of sprinkle all around depending on what you're after. And they're, they're common to come by and they're pretty easy to start from seed as well. So they're a win-win. Sunflowers. Who doesn't love sunflowers? Now, I really like these guys even though they can take a little bit longer to grow a flower. Once they have the flowers though on the plants, um, you can sometimes see multiple bumblebees on the same flower or butterflies. Like my, this past year, my, I grew mammoth sunflowers, those big gigantic guys that are, you know, taller than you are. And within just the one flower was like six or seven bees, butterflies, like they just absolutely love it. And you can toast the seeds. So it is technically something you could eat later, or you can just like string it up and have a bird feeder over the winter because the birds just love eating that. They're just also gorgeous. So who doesn't love sunflowers? They have to go on the list. And a couple other guys that are just easy and fun to have around. I have noted these guys because they're very cold tolerant. So if you have a pretty harsh winter, these ones are good. Um, tall white flowers of Miss Manners, crocus. Crocus are just like tiny little guys. They're also super, super early flowering. They are one of the first flowers. They're known to sprout when there's even still snow on the ground, which is kind of fun. And then daffodils, classic perennial garden flower. Now I've noted here, and you can take a snapshot if you want to, this is just sort of like ones that bloom all season, ones that will bloom only in the early part of the season and then quit. So something to think about. Um, because that's part of it. We got to keep our flowers going all season long. And then your midsummer and your late summer flowering plants. You could snap a quick shot of that if you would like, or even just refer back. And that is it. That is all. So there are so many more flowers that you can find. I recommend, you know, the, the medicinal flowers are right at the top of my list. If that's also something you're into, that would be a good one to start with. And then the ones that are going to be protections for other plants in the garden. So having a look at this companion planting list, you will see lots of flowers on here. I did not note any of the perennials, but you're going to see nasturtiums and dandelions and alyssum and those kind of, those are always at the top as well as priorities. Um, and then after that, you know, perennials and just sprinkle around for easy, less work in future seasons. That's kind of my order of operations. After that, go crazy, stick whatever other flowers you want. But if you're sort of thinking like budget or space and stuff like that, companion first, maybe medicinal second, and also perennials are kind of how I decide to dedicate space. Mostly it's things that I like to eat, but then I always want to have a little bit of flowers in there as well. So can't wait to see what you do decide to sprinkle around your garden for color, and we will see you guys again soon.